and should pray for my management of the spirit. If you want, please. Sure. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you so much for today. We just bless everybody tonight on what we're going to hear in the book of Romans today, Father. Just speak to our hearts and whatever um, you want to really dig right into us, Father, I just pray that you have ears to hear, heart to understand, and later um, to apply what you have been speaking to us about. So again, thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Holy Sister. Nice. So um, tonight, well, all of these sessions in particular, we will what, what we will do, as I would have explained in last, last week, I'm just going to repeat it here again. What we're going to be doing is actually within the first hour, and we started about 15 minutes into it here today, and we had the greetings and so on. Um, as of next week, we would pretty much come in about 10 minutes too everybody settles in so from eight o'clock we get started All right so we get we usually we, we will get started from eight and we within the first hour um these sessions are not going to be jam-packed with information because the last thing i want you to do is to be number one oversaturated and number two you need to actually understand what you what 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 you're covering here if you are to incorporate it in, into your life all right a lot of just a whole lot of data we are not even though this is people would refer to this as theology as you all who already know us, you know that we don't work with that. It's very more practical or the practicality of the theology, so to speak. So we're going to slow it down in these sessions where we're going to be pretty much covering one thing at a time. The first hour we will do that. And the second hour we will open up for everybody to discuss. Right? As the group gets bigger, we have about, how much of us, 11 here? 3, 6, 9, yeah, 11. So as the groups, if the groups, if the group increases, what we will do is actually make use of the breakout rooms where a person can divide and we have a nice intimate setting where we can discuss and get to know each other a little more and build more of a community atmosphere. Make sense? Nice. All right. So you know, I'm good. I, I can hear you all. Not sure why my microphone is working. I'm using Google. Okay. Anyway, I'm listening. Thank you. Okay, Vida, we just read a message. Just says, hello, I'm good. I can hear you all. Not sure why my microphone is not working right. I'm using Bluetooth. Anyway, I'm listening. Thank you. All right. So, a pleasure to meet you, Vida. I am, is this Vida Point Dexter? By chance? Yes. All right. Vida, where are you from? If you don't mind me asking. India. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, well, I don't think we have formally met before. My name is Zin. Zin as in Zeddy, any? Also known as Zin El Fuego on the mic. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually from the, the Caribbean, the Caribbean Trinidad and Tobago. All right, so if you do have any issues with my accent, please feel free to message and I will slow down accordingly. All right, nice. So before we actually, all right, nice, you're welcome. So before we actually dive into the book of Romans in particular, um, there are a few things that are actually, that we need to take into consideration before we venture into this letter. All right, um, number one in particular, well, before we actually go into the considerations on the screen, the first thing I would like to actually remind everyone here, as I mentioned last week, is that what we are going to be covering here is going to be a little different to what you may have been already familiar with in what I categorize as the westernized perspective of the New Testament. Um, this in particular, the New Testament is written through the lens of the scriptures. And so we are going to be very, very particular with actually meant keeping that reference point. All right, so the first thing that we wanna actually take into consideration here is the writer of this letter, all right, who Paul is. Paul was a Pharisee, so we just need to get a general idea of what a Pharisee is. Um, with these three considerations that, that we're seeing on the screen here, each and, each and every one of them, I can very easily spend two hours on each one. But that will not 
get us far with Romans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're gonna, I'm going to do here is going to give some very, very brief information as to these three things here so that we can actually get into Romans. When we get into Romans in particular is where we will begin to identify key things that we should we should know about Romans as we go about as we go about it so that we would use the actual session to dive into scripture instead of actually me talking about these things before so as we go along we will discuss that all right so the first thing that we want to take in conclusion as i mentioned is who paul is he was a pharisee so we want to have a, a general idea as to what a pharisee is um also the lens of the biblical characters right you'll find that the lens of the biblical characters is very 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 different dramatically different from our westernized perspective and of course the role of the garden of of the garden of eden in the scriptures right all of this is actually from the ancient hebrew perspective of, of, the, of the bible and so um all of that is from the ancient hebrew perspective of the bible so that so definitely there, there are going to be some differences from what you what you usually hear all right so the first the first question is who is paul all right now to put it very very briefly everybody knows paul as the apostle the apostle paul um paul was um a roman a roman citizen but born to jewish parents israelites in particular in the scriptures, Paul identifies in the very book of Romans, Paul identifies himself both in, in Romans as well as in Philippians. He identifies himself as an Israelite or the tribe of Benjamin. All right, that's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So that ties him very much intimately into um, the lineage of the characters of the Bible. And also he identifies himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. All right. When he says when he says that he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, what he's literally referring to is that he was a Pharisee that exceeded the accomplishments of other Pharisees. All right. So, what is a Pharisee? Anybody here know what a Pharisee is? What exactly is a Pharisee? As I said, we want to spend a whole hour on this, so as, as brief as you can. What, what what have you known? Or what do you know a Pharisee to be? Well, a Pharisee has, uh, uh, <clears throat> they were considered a, a very elite uh, among the uh, Hebrew people. They were also very proud of the fact that uh, they exceeded in righteousness and in doctrine and in teaching. And uh, they, uh, they were quite proud of their religion. Yes. Heavily heavily steeped in it and uh, yeah, they, they in contrast to the Sadducees they had a, a belief system they believed in the resurrection the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees did not, in different things the denominations even then in, in Israel were evident there right. were various groups like that Nicely, nicely. Thank you, Holy Brother. All right. Another, another very important factor that we want to take into consideration here when we're considering Pharisees is that the Pharisees, as our Holy Brother Norman was actually saying, they're a little bit in contrast to the Sadducees. The Sadducees don't really believe in anything supernatural, but the Sadducees also are very specific to like written scripture, whilst Pharisees incorporated what is known today as the Oral Torah. So they they were also the sect that were also very very um specific to keeping that and just as our holy brother no one put it they prided themselves on that all right now paul was a pharisee which means um well let me throw this question out you notice that jesus had disciples but when it came to going to gentiles jesus obviously chose paul all right why why do you think that is in your comprehension of the scriptures, why do you think there was a why 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 did you just choose the Pharisee, um, Paul, a Pharisee, and not just one of the disciples? In the general panorama of the scriptures. Now there is no right and wrong answer to this, so just let's hear your thoughts. 
Yeah. Was it because he was a Roman citizen? Well, that was one. Was a Roman citizen. Um, I could could be that um, to get away from just staying with your people and expanding out, like if. Like, because Pharisees and the, and everybody wanted to, it was just strictly what their people they wanted to help their people, right? right? So if you go outside, um, for him to do that would probably be a conflict. Or God wanted to get rid of conflict inside of him about others. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Anybody well, else? What's your guess? Second. I have a guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead. So, I've always thought that the reason God chose Paul specifically was because of, it was just like he chose one of the person, almost like this enemy, because the Pharisees were against Jesus, and then um, Paul was, was against his people, and... So it's almost like that story of, you know, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So in the so as I said, there's no right and no wrong answer to this. So what I'm gonna just say here now is actually my understanding based on the general panorama of what Paul is doing in scripture. All right. And what I understand on, on my end is that um if you notice that all of these Jesus' disciples, they were they had trades. Everybody ever realize that? Who's a fisherman, who's a tax collector, all of these different things. Right? And now in the cultural, in the cultural um let's say in the cultural um perspective of the people wanted, which I think brings me to the next slide. Eh? Yes, bring me to the next slide, man. All right, so <laughs> Right. So, in the, in, the, in, the, in the cultural perspective of, of the people, you realize that all of Jesus' disciples were actually into trades. Now, in in Israel, and in, in Jesus' day, um, Jesus in particular, in the in the in the setting that that he was in, there was a a system that was actually put in place. Right. Part of that system still existed in Israel, by the way. So, what was what 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 would usually take place is that. There was there were phases put in put in place for the general Jew. When we say Jew, we're talking about Judeans. Israel, uh, Judeans. The word Jew actually came about through English kings that actually changed the name from Judean to Jews. Right, but when 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 this Bible was being translated and so on, so it's really Judeans. Um, they had a system where within well, a system that's actually divided into three. Right? No, I can't go into depth into this again. This is another topic that we can easily spend time on. So I would actually encourage you to take note of this and to go and research it. Right? There, had, there was actually a, a system of pretty much three systems of schooling, which was not separate. It flowed one into the next. Right? The first in particular is actually known as Beth Sefer, which is where the, 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 the people would memorize the Torah. Right, Beth Sefer is still existent today. You can YouTube Beth Sefer and see the school in action where they spend time in song memorizing the Torah. Now, usually after Beth Sefer, you go into what's referred to as Beth Midrash, which is where you go and you begin to try to, to, to memorize the, the prophets. Right, and after Beth Midrash, if you if you are well one of the best, better students in the system, they will go into what they refer to as Beth Talmud which is where you find a rabbi to be taught by right the rabbi will actually choose one choose people to be disciples now if you didn't actually if you didn't um if you didn't continue along that school and after the first one because mem the law memorize mem mem memorization of the law in particular was a requirement for all right after circumcision you're required to actually your next step was to memorize the law uh, wherever you wherever you didn't continue on that the cultural practice, someone in the waiting room, hold on. Okay, do you see someone in the waiting room? Uh, I sent a message about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> we are not seeing that message, are you? sorry. No problem. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so if, 
if you didn't actually go from one to the next if you are uh, so let's say you went through the torah and you didn't continue the practice was that you find a trade right you, the practice is you you would go and you you find a trade and you, you go work or work with your family business and so on so when we see jesus in particular sorry jesus the disciples you see that jesus the disciples are men who are fishermen from different areas of, of the society so you know in particular they didn't really go into the full extent of what was what was actually acknowledged as a normal schooling system then yeah that's why when when some of these leaders would hear peter speak they would say they hear what they watch him so he's a fisherman he, he he shouldn't have that kind of knowledge as well as boldness and strength in what he's saying he had to be with jesus because of where they would have actually stopped in the in the recognized schooling system now paul in particular was a pharisee which means paul went through all of that and paul would have exceeded everybody else as a pharisee of the pharisee and one i think one of the reasons i think that one of the main reasons i think that that paul was actually t- um, chosen in in addition to what everybody expressed is that paul with the knowledge that he has you cannot toss Paul around the place when it comes to scripture. Right? That is a man that will stand up there and take any argument and bring it into its correct perspective. And also um on that on that on that on that on that front he, he would have been solid and then on the other front the fervor that he had actually worked for Christ. So he was very very um very so to speak hot when it comes to what he believes and what, what the scripture is and so he came into Christ knowledge of the, of Christ and that was just transferred. And that way went with it. Yeah. So um that's that's is that that's actually with regards to to, to Paul the other thing that we want to take into consideration here is the lens of the biblical characters. Now, we know baptism in particular as being baptized into Christ Jesus. Not many people are very much aware of the fact that baptism was not started with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was not the inventor of baptism. He didn't, he didn't create it or he didn't get any special revelation to start baptism. <laughs> All right? Baptism is actually a very common jewish practice just introduced in the, in the, in the in the gospels a bit differently and because it's actually translated from greek they use different words but baptism is very much a jewish practice so like when you let's say for example persons who persons who and i hope i'm not moving too quickly with this because i don't want to spend too much time on these points here we want to get into to to romans um so baptism in particular was a very common practice under the under the law under the torah so if for example you were a non-jew and you decided that you wanted to be a jew as a man you would actually have to go through physical ceremonial circumcision and then you go and and then you are baptized right as a woman you didn't have to go through circumcision but you'll be initiated by the same baptism right those baptisms in particular they're pretty much referred today as mikvahs, which is just a, an area where there's accumulation of water. And the context of baptism is they actually so f- let's using the 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 person who is non an, an, an uncircumcised who's non non Jew as an example. Um, after you are baptized, you'll be after you are circumcised, you'll be baptized, and the baptism represented entering into the womb again the water the water was seen as in the capacity of a womb so you dip into that water and you rise as as you you are rebirthed that is why paul any paul jesus john they're actually speaking about be born again All right now the first the first birth for them is actually where they were dipped into that water and they were born into the con in into the covenant so when they went when it, when the nation went astray they were actually dipped in that water again so they said it's actually being born again 
Gentiles are not born again. I know it's common church talk, but to be born again would mean that you would have to have, would have, would have had to be under the first covenant and baptized into that covenant. Paul takes the same, the same concept and he refers to it not being born again, but he refers to it as resurrection. So instead of actually using it, looking at it from the perspective of a womb rising, it's the same concept, just different reference where we as Gentiles, according to that law, would actually go to the grave just as Jesus went to the grave and we rise anew. Now, when, in, the, in the Jewish system, when, once you hit that water and you rise, you left your, your life behind and the Torah became your life. Everything was Torah. It was that covenant and how you keep that covenant, how you keep that contract. You, you um, and Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 10 that you are baptized unto Moses. All right, that's because Moses was pretty much the prototype under the law. That's why Jesus refers to the Pharisees and he says, he refers to the Pharisees and he says that you sit in the seat of Moses. Because under the law, you're not baptized unto Christ, you're baptized unto Moses. Moses was the prototype and so all prophets and so on, they patterned Moses. Everybody referred to Moses as the man of God. All right? Now there's a lot more with that in particular, but as I said, we can't dive into all of that here in this session. That will be more specialized sessions. Um, in the in New Covenant, we are baptized into Christ. And that, and that, 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 that baptism represents, even though it is not commonly taught, I strongly encourage you to, to, to take note of this. Because it is part of your experience in this covenant. You are, you are um, the... In, in the same the same concept of the rebirth as in the water being a womb for us the water representing the grave and rising from the dead the whole idea is that when you hit that water when you're submerged you leave the old man behind and you rise with the name of Yeshua which means you're no longer the person that you will you rise and Yeshua is what you are and your life becomes Yeshua Yeshua is the word. So all of the promises in the scripture is now, it now defines you, defines who you are. Is that making sense so far? Yeah? Anybody lost? Did I go too quickly? <laughs> I think it's very good that you mentioned about the mikvah and the, I guess, is that the Hebraic understanding of being submerged in under the water as a womb i've never heard of that before zane yeah I consider that a, it, a womb like that's why that's why uh, what's his name um uh, when jesus spoke to um nicodemus nicodemus related to that he said that, i have to come back in my mother's womb that is exactly what he was referring to sir is that right yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole Jewish talk going on there. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, but it's been overlooked because most persons already understand it. In the, in the Old Testament, it was actually, if I remember the word carefully, it is referred to as um, Tevila, I think, which is the same concept, but in the New Testament, it's, it's referred to as baptism. With the same submersion in water. People actually Jews would, would build these things into their into their culture, into their homes, and there were places where you would go where there were persons allocated for you to be dipped. There is also used for like women who actually went through menstruation and so on. All those things under the law for you to be ritually clean. That is what they that's what they're referring to there. The same thing. Make sense? Very good. Thank you. No problem, no problem. All right, so um, the, so having said that, the next thing that we ought to know is that once you once you were baptized in that covenant, you were baptized unto Moses, you were you were required to memorize scripture. Now this is where it gets very very. The blinders need to kind of come on a little bit here, <laughs> right, because when they actually began to memorize scriptures, they live scriptures. Everything that they do, everything that they live. Is from the perspective of scriptures. We in the Western world, we have actually seen the Bible and that we take all of that 
and we apply it to um <clears throat> we apply it to well i shouldn't say apply we take all kinds of external sources and we jam it into the bible to make it make sense for us <laughs> right whilst they on the other hand they memorize this and they live from it right that's why in particular in the old in here in the western where we say theology because to us we are actually trying to understand this thing we take all these external sources and we must and we need it into the bible like we need in bread but they actually lived from that right so they saw life through the scriptures which brings me which brings me to a very important point the role of the garden of eden in the bible and again i can easily spend two hours two three hours on this we want to keep this as brief as possible here also um so what's the role of the garden of eden in the bible so we have actually been taught the garden of eden um i actually posted a file a pdf file in the discord community last week on this in particular for those of you who may not have gotten it we encourage you to, to go across the discord if you, you if you're there it's supposed to be posted there it will be posted there so you can actually peruse that i've taken that file from bible project um from from yeah from bible project and i've actually posted it there it was a it's a file that cut, cuts down a huge amount of work for me so you just read that right <laughs> nice so um when it comes to the garden of eden we've actually been taught the garden of eden very very succinctly we put the garden of eden from the perspective of well i put it like this we, we see the garden of eden through the lens of nasa right where we have satellites and we can see planets and galaxies and all of this kind of thing and so we read the garden of eden and we attribute nasa to genesis chapter one and because of that we see we, we we look at the garden of eden through the lens of cosmic creation and how god put everything in order in seven days right now in the context of the scripture and, and the cultural component of the, of the scriptures um i don't i don't think if i if you haven't heard this before and you haven't read that document i just want to actually state that the garden of eden is actually in the ancient Hebrew perspective and context representative of a garden temple right i encourage you to go and get that document in discord and, t- and, and, and look at that the garden of eden is actually representative of a garden temple and in that document there are scriptures that actually show that the seven days that was taken to um to the seven days that were elaborated in the genesis narrative is actually reflected in, t- in both the construction of the tabernacle as well as the temple right just as the tabernacle was built and you had seven speeches which was god's words to moses and then seven acts seven speeches sabbath seven acts rest in the same way genesis is actually written where there's seven speeches genesis chapter one to chapter two verse three and chapters from chapter from verse four to the end of the chapter would be the acts that's actually a couplet chapter they are par- they're actually meant to be parallels and chapter two is parallels with specificity does that make sense all right i strongly encourage you to actually get a document and, and review that because i can't go into all of that here tonight that's easily two hours <laughs> that makes sense everybody very good i will start today i thought that the garden of eden was a was more of a spiritual in a spiritual dimension and the garden here on earth was a a reflection of that uh, supposedly uh, where adam was to bring heaven to earth right Uh, uh, yeah i understand what you're saying um but but in the in the context of the well to really understand the garden of eden moses built the tabernacle as a mobile version of the garden so everything that actually took place in the first temple which was the garden temple it was reflected in the tabernacle 
the entire tabernacle structure of, 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 of the tabernacle is a re, is really a reflection of that all right as i said i can't i, I, I wish but if we go into that day we ain't finished you know <laughs> right so you can look at it there's a pdf in discord thank right, you you can, you can take a look at it there and if you have any questions we we, we, we deal with it in the upcoming sessions lovely nicely all right so with the establishment of that you notice that um when adam actually was put out of this temple um the garden in particular being the temple the priest in sorry i jump i jump forward there so adam and even adam and eve was that they were actually placed in the garden and the garden was really in adam and eve was really god breathing himself into dust and the garden was really a reflection of the man the spirit of the man when he was put out of the garden it was also a reflection of his spirit when he actually moved from self-existent function to codependency to seek life outside of you was actually indirect is actually an indirect acknowledgement of lack on the inside within the garden in particular there is the there is the parallelism of the breath of life with the water of life he was put outside of the garden because when he made his decision, he was voided of spirit and therefore he was put outside of the garden where there was no water. He, he, it, it represented his spiritual state and perspective. Now, if you follow the, if, if you follow the Genesis narrative, you'd realize that everybody from Genesis right back down to Malachi, they are really searching. Abraham and Lot is a very good example as Genesis 14, if I'm not mistaken if i'm don't hold me to that but <laughs> in that in that chapter you notice that when abraham and lot decided to go their separate ways lot looked across to sodom and said that it looked watered like the garden of eden so he went there abraham at the end of the chapter looked at the, at the trees of mamre because it was actually again related to the garden trees now all short description of the garden of eden is actually looked upon as the actual ideal atmosphere for everyone and they sort it so they look for where it looks and it resembles the garden of eden now there are two reasons for that number one that was actually passed down because they were the descendants of abraham so i mean descendants of adam of the adam and when the adam made his decision his memory was pretty much passed down into their into their nature as the memory of that was passed down into his descendants as a nature as well as the fact there was there's clear indication that this was actually communicated to to the characters of the bible now what they didn't know is what paul revealed which is what he stated that this was a mystery that was hidden from generations and from ages christ in you so what you see in, in the old testament is that they are pursuing getting back into the garden not understanding that this is actually the, the necessity for change, spiritual change. The person that you see in the New Testament in particular, in the Old Testament that speak about it is David, where he says, create in me a clean heart, renew it in me a right spirit. Right? And that, and Jesus being the seed of David was actually the fulfillment of that. So Jesus in particular is really, by the restoration of Christ in you, is really the restoration of the spirit that actually the garden reflected. Does that make sense? Everybody following that? Yes, yes. Yeah, nicely. Any questions? <laughs> Problem. Awesome. All right. So that's the shortest version of that that I can that that, that I've ever given. Tanya. I think I have a quick okay. question. Uh huh. Um. Hello, Jimmy. Hello. How are you, sir? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You know, I, I, I guess I wasn't so sure because um, I don't have my laptop charger right now and I need to save my battery for my guitar lesson tomorrow, which is over Zoom. But uh, I, I thought I'd do this since I'm not really doing anything tonight. Okay. Okay. If, 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 if you, um, you have problems with battery, you will to access this on the YouTube after after the session so if you're unable to do that now you can access the, the, the session on youtube yeah, i mean i think i should be good i have like 
97% battery. Okay, okay. All right. We will be here, we will be here for about an hour again, so. All right, so where are we? Let me see if I have my back, or let me, let me see if I have my Bible. Okay. <laughs> All right. Nice. Got we, we, the Bible. All right, so we are in the book of Romans. All right, I'm Roman. just, yeah, I'm just actually doing a very short overview of some things that we ought to take into consideration before we actually get in. So now coming to the end of that overview and we begin shortly. I just have a quick question, Zane. Hold on, eh? Tanya. Um, Hold on, Tanya. Um, Jimmy, okay. as as we go through these sessions, we will actually to, to mute the mic so that we don't All get right. any feedback. All right? I'm gonna... Nice. Thank you, sir. Yes, Tanya. Okay. So I was just wondering, um, there's one thing that's been playing in my mind for a while about God breathing the breath into Adam. Now, was it uh, he blew breath into the ground and the man formed, or did he form the man and then blew breath into him? It is it's actually represented in uh, parallelism. So yeah. it, seemed, it seems it is in the parallelism that's represented is actually where it's like that aspect you're talking about is actually represented mm -hmm. in a somewhat of a triplet. Okay. So it's kind of, it gives the impression that it was one and the same. Okay. It was it's actually the same thing. It not it, one didn't come before the other. So it formed all in one. Yeah. Ooh, that's pretty good. Okay. In triplet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, right. So what Paul would have revealed in his, in his gospel is that Jesus is actually, Jesus being, Jesus is the pretty much the restoration of that spirit back into men, which is of something that we will speak about as you go along. All right. Um, so let's start with Romans. We start in Romans chapter one. We will info this, this is one to four. All right. And um, today in particular, what, I, what, what we're going to do is spend the next 20 minutes after we read verses one to four. We've, as I mentioned in these sessions, we want to take one concept at a time. We will not try to force too much into the session. So I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. All right. So for those of you who have actually other versions, you can still follow along. If not, you can just watch the Amplified, the, ampli the, the, the literature on the actual screen. I'm sharing the screen here. All right, so verse 1 in particular says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative, set apart for preaching the gospel of, of God, the good news of salvation, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the sacred scriptures. It goes on to say in verse 3 and 4, the good news regarding his son, who, as to the flesh, his, his human nature, was born a descendant of David to fulfill the covenant promises, and as the divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness, was openly designated to be the Son of God with power in a triumphant and miraculous way by his resurrection from the dead. All right, now there's one more thing. So let's go back to verse one. There's one more thing that I'm actually encouraging you to take into consideration here now we in the westernized christian culture we have actually used the word god very loosely right if i ask everyone here what is god who is god i would get probably 14 people here and i probably get 14 interpretations as to what god is and who god is now the context of god as mentioned in the hebrew scriptures sorry in the new testament is really a reflection of the concept of god in the Old Testament, which is in the Hebrew Scriptures. Which means basically what I'm saying is, for us when we say God, we have a very abstract idea as to what God is, where God is, and what God could be possibly doing. Right? We really don't know. <laughs> right? But on the other hand, in the um, in the in the ancient Hebrew scriptures, when we, see, when, we, when we look at God, we're really looking at the word Elohim. Now, the terms in the, in the Old Testament are not also, also not used in the context that we use these terms in the New Testament or in the Westernized culture. So when we use 
terms like God, Jesus, and we use names in the New Testament, we say Lord. These are names that are actually attributed in the form of a label to be able to identify one thing from the next. In the, in the scriptures, they have a very a much more, in their terms, they refer to it as a very concrete perspective with regards to names, which means names and scriptures are pretty much used in the capacity that we use titles on a, on, on a, on a, in, a, in a business or in employment. In the same way that we use the word manager, accountant, executive director, human resource manager, um, employee, supervisor, those are titles, and those titles come with an expectation of a particular function. Does that make sense? Yeah? In the scriptures, every single name is seen as the same. So when we hear Elohim in the Bible, that comes with a function which actually identifies the, the, the essence as well as the function of that character and how they actually fit into each narrative. So when we say God in the, in the New Testament, it's really what is referred to in the Old Testament as Elohim. And Elohim means power or authoritative power. So when we say God or Elohim, we're really looking at the authority, the authoritative power. Much as the word Lord in the New Testament is seen as just a title that's placed there and you see that person is greater than you. But the word Lord in the Old Testament is actually the translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh, which means the self-existent and the eternal. So in the scriptures, where does the identification of the self-exist or Yahweh present? Usually when Yahweh is speaking, it is so functional that when Yahweh is speaking, it's really the self-existent and the eternal one speaking, which in the context of everyone else who he's speaking to, you know that he, the person he's speaking to are not self-existent. They are codependent. And the self-existent one is given the self-existent perspective amongst men who may see things through a very codependent perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah? So throughout, when, when we read through Romans here, I'm going to encourage everyone, when we say God, we're going to say Elohim, authority to power, because you actually identify yourself as sons of God. Not so? And if you identify yourself as sons of God, then what you're really doing is like actually identifying yourself as sons of power. Authority to power. Does that ring differently for you now? <laughs> it means to say that you actually have a function and your function is to be authoritative which is where most of your power begins to flow so the, everything you're dealing like even with healing you say be healed because that's authority you don't say please heal please heal him be healed because you are sons of authority sons of power make sense Nice. So, if you come back to verse 1, we see Paul, a bond servant of Christ Yeshua, called as an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative, set apart for preaching the gospel of Elohim, preaching the gospel of power, of authority to power, the good news of salvation, which he promised beforehand, his pro he promised beforehand through his prophets in the sacred scriptures. So just briefly, before we actually get into any the rest of the chapter or the rest of the verses, let's go back to verse 1 in particular. It says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. So here's a question. Everybody knows that Jesus is the Christ. Yeah? What is Christ? What is Christ? We know that Jesus is the Christ. What is Christ? Because Christ here is also a title that comes with a function. <laughs> Go ahead, Antonia. Um, could be the anointed one. Yeah, but what is that referring to? What is that? 
Is he the spirit? He, say again? The spirit? Like the what? spirit of the beginning? The spirit of the beginning. All right. Lovely. Jimmy? I'm going to say the sun. All right. Yeah. Anybody else? So for the next 20 minutes, I want to actually unpack that so that you are clear because you are identifying yourself with Christ Yeshua. <laughs> right? And if you don't understand what Christ is, you really don't understand what you are identifying with, nor the function that comes with that or what it is referring to. So when we say Christ, yes, it's the anointed one. But Christ is also the, the, the translation of what is referred to as the Messiah. The Messiah here is the Savior. Now to understand that, what we need to do, as I mentioned, the lens of the scriptures pretty much are rooted in the Genesis narrative. So what we see in the Genesis narrative, let's put this very, just they're going to take this in parts. What we see in the Genesis narrative is that God breathes himself, a thought of himself. He says, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, says, let, let us make man in our, in our own image and likeness. Which means what God breathed, if that is a parallel, what is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, is breathed into the man. Then everything that is written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 30, is pretty much the definition of the nature of the man. Just making sense so far. God breathing himself into man, into dust, is really God breathing the thought of the vastness of himself into dust. And that man would have been God in flesh which is actually what is referred to as the word made flesh. What God said is breathed into the man and what God said becomes his energetic nature. Does that make sense? Uh, can, can I just uh, say something on that, uh, Zane? Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, I have, like um, Tanya, I have been mulling over these things in my mind. And to me, God... I don't see him as a creator. He has not created me. He ha I'm his offspring. Therefore, when he breathed into the form, this is where the invisible took form. Yes. And I, I like the idea in my own mind that he impregnated Adam with the seed of his very essence. Well, because elsewhere uh, in scripture, it's marked that we are of, of a holy seed, you know? Well, I wouldn't say, now, the term impregnated here, um, even though I understand what you're alluding to, I wouldn't really go with the term impregnated personally. Because to say impregnated would mean that it has to be placed into something to be born. Whereas what really took place in Genesis narrative is that God became flesh he just became physical by a dust does that make sense would imparted be a better word Im imparted his essence to the form i would really i would really i think if we use incarnated okay yeah. that's yeah. good <laughs> yeah well yeah. my point uh, zane is that we are his offspring and not created. So the right. joint, the joint, the connection there has to be like when a, when a human, uh, you know, how should we say, has offspring, it's, it's through a seed form, you know? Right, right, yeah. So I'm trying to look at the connection. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Right, so when, when he actually did that, you notice that... In the rest of the narrative, Adam is the one that actually is naming the animals. He's in, the, in the context of the narrative, he's naming the animals and he's doing a lot of different things in the form, in the same fashion as the creator himself. Because Adam is really the creator or God, Elohim, 
Yahweh Elohim in dust. Now, when Adam made his decision, Adam pretty much voided himself of, or we well, can say voided himself because that's in the context of, of the scriptures. But what he also did was actually began to use a different word as his motivation and inspiration. So he listened, they listened to the serpent and they actually listened to that serpent and began to follow that serpent. Now in the scripture, the person that you are actually listening to is the person that, when I say listening to the person that you're taking information from or you're being, or you're being inspired from, that person in the scripture is technically referred to as your father. So in the in regards of, in the context of physical procreation, you have man. I have my popcorn watching this and learning. <laughs> hey. Let's share popcorn now, man. We're going to with you, right? Let me eat some popcorn and talk to them. <laughs> yeah, so um, so in, in the context of... Um, Lord, I lose my train of thought there. Right. In the context of physical creation, what you have is the spirit of man reproduced. And everybody who's actually reproduced is actually a multiplication of that person's spirit. In the context of God, just like Jesus, this, this is actually reflected even in... Yeah, this is actually reflected even in... Um, this is reflected even in the discipleship both in the old testament and in the new testament when a disciple would come under a teacher in the old testament in the school of the prophets the, the prophets will take on disciples and because those people who actually become his disciples they learn from him disciples will refer to the prophet as father and the prophet will refer to the disciples as his children much like rabbi and disciples the rabbi is referred to as the father and the disciple refers to as children. That's simply because what they're doing is actually taking information and they're inspired or living from what that person says. Does that make sense? In the context of the Genesis narrative, this is where we come in really, if you understand this clearly. Hold on. Yeah, I just... Right, so um, yeah, in the context of the Genesis narrative, what you see is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, God speaks, and that is breathed into the man, which means that God's thought about himself reproduced. So there is God on earth and God in, and God in all. Does that make sense? When Jesus speaks, he says, I and the Father are one, meaning I, the Father, are one, the same being, same spirit, multiplied. Yes, Tonya. So, um, just to clarify, the uh, what God breathed into Adam yeah. is be able to create, be able to speak life. Everything uh, that God everything is. Everything that ba Papa does, we do. Yes. So, just want to clarify that. Yes. <laughs> right. Now, when, God, when Adam did that, sorry, when Adam was created, Adam was doing that, Adam named the animals. And to name in the Hebrew means to give life to. To give breath to which means he was a creator now i know that may sound a little new if you're actually coming from most westernized doctrine but the name and breath in hebrew is one and the same so the same to name the animal is actually breathe life into the animal which means he was created and was creating yeah now when adam made his decision pay attention when adam made his decision adam chose a different voice to listen to which means he switched fathers right because means he's actually living from someone else or something else and what he basically did in the context of the narrative was voided himself of spirit and he began to live dysfunctionally because he's actually designed to be Yahweh Elohim in flesh God in flesh so he's living dysfunctionally as you, as you read through the rest of the scriptures, I'm putting this in a 20-minute version here, right? 
as you read this, as you read this through the rest of the scriptures, you realize that men they're living from their nature, and their nature is pretty much corrupt. And when when the when the tabernacle is created through Moses to reflect the garden narrative, to to, to reflect the garden temple, the priests in particular reflect Adam and Eve in the garden. And when the priests speak, the priests do not identify themselves by anything else. When the priests speak, they say, thus says Yahweh. What, what is actually showing is that the priest was a reflection of the original creation, the original man, and how the original man functioned in union with the God of the temple. So when you speak to the priest, you're really speaking to the God of the temple. You speak to Adam in the garden, you're speaking to the God of all creation. Is that making sense so far? That's a second tidbit. Everybody following that? Now, you see that with priests, as well as you see that with the prophets. That's why James tells you, use the prophets as your mentor. Because the prophets also says, thus says Yahweh. Those are the men that are actually functioning, resembling the original creation. The creation that was actually not called Adam in the garden, but Yahweh Elohim. Is this making sense? All right. Nice, we're going better than I thought. <laughs> Great. So the priests and the prophets, they were there and they're functioning, even though they were fallen, they were pretty much functioning in the capacity of the original creation. And so they say, thus says Yahweh, thus says Yahweh. Right? To be a priest of God is really to be a son of God in the scriptures, as it's as it is actually reflected. Now, many of us actually see how God deal with the people with covenants. And for those of you who may be questioning that, a covenant is really the closest way to hold fallen creation responsible to the original intention. I want to say that again. I want to digest that. A covenant is really a mechanism that is used to hold dysfunctional creation responsible to the original function. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. So that's why you see all through the Old Testament, there are covenants. Nazarite covenant, Mosaic covenant, Abrahamic covenant. These are fallen or dysfunctional men who are not functioning according to the original intention. And the covenant is the closest way to keep them responsible to function. This is where Jesus comes in. So in the garden, God breathed his life into dust and made himself Yahweh Elohim in flesh. The body is really what is referred to as the Adam, but the name, it comes from the spirit. The spirit is Yahweh Elohim. Jesus is God's breath, his spirit breathed into dust again. Now, the woman is actually under the what is actually stated in Genesis narrative. When Adam did what he did, God said, dust you are, to dust you shall return. Which means the spirit breathing upon the woman is breathing into dust again. And the Adam, this, the Adam is now entered the earth again, Yahweh Elohim in dust. Word made flesh. The same breath, Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 30, is now breathed into, into the woman. And Jesus is referred to as the word made flesh. Which is why you'll notice that Jesus' entire ministry is about authority. It's actually from his nature of the breath that is breathing to him, which is the dominion that was spoken into the Adam, is now in Yeshua. And he is just speaking and manifesting what God's word is in flesh. Pause here again. Everybody following that? It is understandable. Very good. Yeah? Nice. All right. Jamie, you following? Yes. 
Lovely. Any questions at all? Uh, <laughs> no, thank you. All right. Lovely. Yeah, I got one. Yes, sister. Go ahead. Um, I don't even know if it's a question, but it's a thought. Okay. Um, that came up. Uh, so is that why the Bible says the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body? Well said and well quoted, holy sister. Okay. Yahweh is for the body and the body is for Yahweh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> right? Now, when we say, when we also say, Jesus is the word made flesh, Jesus, who is the word, is also referred to as the last Adam. I want you to pay attention. Jesus, who is the word, is also referred to as the last Adam, which literally means that in the beginning was the last, the Adam. And the Adam was with God. And the Adam was God. <laughs> Let it digest that a little bit. Word and the last Adam are one and the same. So if we interchange word with Adam, in the beginning was the Adam. And the Adam was with God. And the Adam was God. But in the spiritual context, if the Adam is the flesh, mm -hmm. name the name really comes from the spirit. So it says wood. But it's the same Adam. The last Adam. Mm. Take a breath. Everybody grasp that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So what is the what is Christ? Christ is the original breath breathed into us again. So Jesus lives this life as the original creation, but without power. Lives in the capacity of a fallen man, without actual corruption, but lives with the limitations that they incurred upon themselves because of their corruption. Goes, nails that to the cross, dies or gives his life because they didn't kill him. He gave his life. He gave his life because he, he was perfect according to the Torah. So God promised life in the Torah. He could probably have put a nail through his head and he wouldn't have died because he, the Torah promised him life because he fulfilled it perfectly. He had to give it up. He died and God resurrects him because God still hasn't fulfilled the promises of the covenants that he fulfilled. So God resurrects him to continue his word. Jesus now breathes upon the disciples, ascends to become all and in all, And now, what he breathed upon his disciples received the Holy Spirit was fulfilled in the upper room where he and Father are one. He did it and Father fulfilled it and breathed into these men the breath of life from the Genesis narrative right back into these men. So the Messiah is really the breath of life back in you again that is why paul says that christ is the savior of the body christ is the breath of the body breath body body breath christ is the head of the body christ is the breath of the body i pause there again <laughs> does that make sense Yes. So that means uh, the word, well, another thought came uh, when it says God is all in all. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Everybody else. So I'm going to pause here, right here, and the next half hour, I'll open up to express your thoughts before we end. Next half hour. Feel free. How does this how does this really impact your comprehension? I know it would have been a bit different from what you were taught, which really doesn't didn't have any it's really abstract what, what we what has what is taught in the Westernized culture. But Christ is really the breath of life back in you again. Which means, let me put it like this: Christ being the breath of life back in you again is the breath of life in the Garden of Eden restored. And therefore, your real name, or 
before, hey, let me just add this to this. In the garden narrative, God breathed himself into dust. The dust, the body is referred to as Adam. And the breath is where the name comes from, which is Yahweh Elohim. Christ is the new Adam. Therefore, God breathing his breath into you makes the body Yeshua. And your name, Yahweh Elohim. The restoration of what was lost in the garden. So that was my story. <laughs> Take some breath. I know this might be a little different, but this is what Christ is. So you are the fullness of your father on earth again. You and the father are one. Okay. Uh, Zane? Go ahead. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, what you're bringing forth about Christ um, lines up with Galatians um, and other parts of Scripture, too. Um, when we try to connect the dots, if I may use that term, mm -hmm. the singular most important uh, thing that happened to Paul when he he left being a Pharisee to being a bond servant mm -hmm. was that he had a revelation and the revelation was uh, found in Galatians uh, 1 15 but when it pleased uh, Yahweh Elohim who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him um, not among, but in the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is the turning point for Paul. Yeah. And this is the gospel that has been lost over the centuries yes sir christ in us the hope of glory yes sir which has always been but we have been blinded to the very fact that we have been carrying this treasure in earthen vessels yeah and and it's really earthen because of your lack of because of your ignorance uh -huh. because yeah. once you once you're weakened the earthen vessels will manifest will be uh expression of life of immortality so this uh, kind of makes me wonder when we speak of being born again or it actually the greek says born from above yeah. it's more like a an opening up of our consciousness to who we really are up to a point because we many people who are like i was i was birthed from above but i fell into a religious system and i lost the fact that what this really meant you know yeah so so in the in the, in the context of the bible those things are very solid they have very solid reference points to so say that you're born from above is the breath from above that is breathed into the dust and the context of the nature of that breath is what is written in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. Does that make sense? Dominion, authority, power. <laughs> yes, but as I say, there are many aspects to this that have opened my eyes uh, since, okay, since Christ indwells everyone, okay, Therefore, I have to be careful that they are all holy siblings, right, brother? Yes, they are. That's why and you the, go and you preach reconciliation. That's to say, that, to say that they in sin is a lie. Yeah. So that flat out. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> and that is why Paul says he preaches Christ. He takes the Gentiles, Christ in you. He didn't say Christ will be in you if you accept him. He says, I am preaching Christ in you. 
if you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and he's not in you, you wouldn't you be lying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what religion, you know, turns us upside down. And um, yes. yes, sir. And uh, I had to I had to really struggle with that. What is the true gospel? You know, yeah. and I just gave a testimony of what that was to me, what what father revealed the true gospel to me. Yeah was you know not these split denominational takes on the gospel well, the but, but the, the gospel of the kingdom but this is it yes, Christ sir. in you the hope of glory the breath of life back in you back in dust <laughs> yeah. so, so again what what you are teaching and I, I must confess you have so much stuff out there Zane I have a hard time putting it together, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm I'm a methodical, you know. I oh, like, okay, okay. I like to go from one thing to another and to grow and expand. But um, and you speak of like the, the this PDF that's available. Well, I'm sorry, but I missed that totally. So okay. I need, I need some kind of point of reference to say. Well, you know, you know that's for me. Okay, I, yeah. yeah. I, Guide me, uh, <laughs> guide me, brother. I'm lost <laughs> in, 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 in the, the Zane world. In the Zane world, <laughs> uh, we will be working um, on actually putting this into its a flowing context, which is actually why we began the Patreon. Because as we began the Patreon, what is using the Patreon, the podcast is actually to flow, so that you can actually give context as we go along. Or what what we have and we have been that's as you rightfully said it's um it's really really um the zane will <laughs> yeah um we had been put not all of these things here but all of these things are just aspects that we have put out there we're really just aspects of these things that we were speaking about and tonight in about 20 minutes i really kind of pull everything together so it's we understand the, the part the the panorama you're dealing with so I, I hope that that actually helped um put some context to the myriads of things that we have over there as you say <laughs> but we're definitely going to be putting that in in um so whatever like a, in a in a fashion of a course so we can put layer upon layer and move that forward does that make sense mm -hmm. I got one thing that's lingering. What's that? What is that? Um, Tell me. I know you said it already, and I just need to hear some more. Uh -huh. The heart, believing in the heart. Right. So in scripture, in scripture, the breath is the word made flesh. What is spoken in, in Genesis narrative, power. The dominion is really been referred to in the Hebrew as power, which is authority made flesh. Now that breath is also heart which means to live from your heart is really to live from what has been breathed into you to live from what you truly think and feel which is weird what paul says his spirit is actually father's spirit is, is now merged into you as the um so you are what you are now the breath of life back in flesh and then Father's Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, is really Abraham's blessings, which is all of the promises in the scriptures, breathed into that as one. So to live from your heart is really to live from what you truly think and feel, to, to live from what is breathed into you. Which is why a religious system, not that I'm bashing the religious system, and for those of you who may from religion, what I'm pointing out here is that a religious system really establishes an external point of comparison, which is a list of rules that actually causes you to live not from the heart but to live from the according to the image of the rules that that, that the rules create when we are to, to, to live from what has been breathed into you you have to abandon those external reference points and live from what has been breathed into you which is what which is which, which is what's in your heart every promise in the scripture is in your heart does that answer your question holy sister yes it do thank you all right nice tanya you going all right there, sister? Just excited. <laughs> Every time I hear what we have, what God is just 
amazing. So, and the more I hear and like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, God's breath, God's life, God's everything. It just fills me up and makes me just, we are so awesome. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, yes. but we are awesome. Yes, we are. So what, in essence, what you look at, we are the fulfillment of John chapter 5 verse 26. And it says, just as the father has life in himself and is self-existent. So he is created to the son to have life in himself and be self-existent. So if God is a source of life, you are a source of life. Oh, it's just amazing. Yes, Jimmy. Go ahead, bro. Um, so I know, like, especially right now in the midst of this pandemic that's been going on for several months, um, the, uh, I guess the passage that's at the end of Romans, um, uh, I'm I'm trying to where where is it that um uh um is it, wait is it is it Romans where it says and now that we know that God works all things for those that are loved and called according to His purpose or am I thinking of something else? Oh, well, that's that's good. Yeah. What what um, what was it? Well, I, I, I'm not exactly where. Uh, where where that is in romans but uh how because i feel like especially right now in the midst of this pandemic um that's applied to us uh how do you think zane that's like especially applied to you like right now well in the context of the scriptures um i know that... i mean even because we we do know it's true for sure yeah, yeah all right so you're looking at romans 8 yeah in the in the context of the scriptures jimmy I know yes. that that ver that arm um, that that verse is just as a concept to actually in the westernized culture only in the westernized culture that verse is actually seen as something that is used to say that any evil thing that is going on is yeah. acceptable is acceptable that though is not the context of the scriptures right um they've actually to, to, to use it like that would be to take to take it out of the context of the passage that is taken from, but definitely in the context of the of um of the of, of the usage in the in, in the actual passage, it refers to personal trials to not trust God. Yeah, that has nothing to do with accepting viruses and pandemics as a matter of fact as sons of what are sons of power you are here to eliminate that from people yeah there i i guess there was another uh another passage in romans uh that i wanted to go through it's in uh i guess romans 8 8 18 but it's probably not considering to do it but um and i'm i'm not sure if this applies to you right now um but it says, uh, um, and I'll guess. Can I give my like two cents of on the on this issue, and then I guess you can chime in your opinion. Sure, go ahead. But um, here I'll just read it, and it says, uh, "I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us." Um, I think uh, that we as believers um, know that there's a that there's a that there's a light and that there that we will have the hope of glory whenever not i'm not i'm not just speaking in like what we're going through right now with this global pandemic but in like no matter what we're going through right but yeah okay so, so i think that's one passage i guess both of those i've been looking on not right. just not like not just right now but even pre-pandemic and definitely past pandemic whenever this is over right 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 i, I hear your heart um so what, what i encourage you to do is actually create a separation between your function in christ and your growth in christ mm -hmm. right so on the functional aspect of this all sons of god are here to be sons of power yeah which would mean to restore life to that which lacks life 
which would be what we do when we heal the sick, resurrect, cast out devils. On the growth side, what you're reading there is really something that the apostles teach James, Paul, Peter, the writer of Hebrews. Yeah. They all speak about it from the perspective of your personal growth into living from the promises of God through your personal difficulties yeah. and not use any personal difficulties as the reference point to live which is where fear and anxiety comes from yeah what they actually do is they allude to two things in the bible number one is the genesis narrative which is where adam instead of living from what was breathed into him he changed his point of reference and compared himself to a tree dressed mm-hmm. himself up like the tree and used the tree as a reference point to really understand who he is so he taught himself naked because the tree was clothed with leaves yeah and then that is actually reflected in the wilderness where the children of israel found themselves in the wilderness of paran and they had difficulty in trusting what god said so they looked at the lack the lack of food and all of the things that were lacking and they were inspired by that into fear and anxiety yeah so what I understand there with regards to the scriptures that you're quoting there is not really specific to pandemic per se because as sons of God to function, but if the pandemic is causing you to struggle with regards to how you trust God, then yes, it would apply in that context. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. Thanks for thanks for sharing your your, your heart, Debra. I appreciate yeah, that. Sure. All right. Um Holy Sister Hannah. You wanna share your your heart a little bit? Oh sorry. That's all right. Hey. Um Well, I mean, I I have learned some things about this and I really like the way that you um explain and i think if anybody that i haven't read the pdf for whatever you were talking about right. but i've i've been listening to a lot of videos and learning a lot about the um that genesis narrative and i'll tell you it's like it pulls together the whole bible um and i'm excited to go through this romans because um just to see how it started in the Genesis narrative, but it goes through the Bible. Um, and it's all through the Bible. And like you said before, and I want to listen more to John and stuff, the things that you're doing on podcasts, right. because um, that brings up Jesus and how he's talking about um, all the, when he uses the wordings of the Genesis narrative, um, when he speaks all in the Bible. So all shorty, all shorty saying he speak in Genesis. They're just, Genesis talk going on. <laughs> yeah, and that's amazing. Um, so I mean, I'm I just feel like uh with when it comes to being self-existent, it's almost like it's a growth in awareness, like you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And I loved about the baptism because I was wondering about that. And I had heard you talk about baptism a little bit before, but um regarding baptism and how they used to baptize before John the Baptist Baptist baptized people, right. and um, and what it meant then, and then what it means now, and that was that was very cool. I actually was baptized when I was seven or nine by my father in a swimming pool. Okay, okay. And I'll tell you, I felt it. It was a real experience that I had, and. Um, I remember it was a real experience of life for me and it was very exciting. And it was just to me, like a choice I made to like you, like you described it. So, um, I don't know. Pretty awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pauline, you mind me calling upon you like to anything that, how does this understanding impact you? Does it give context to things? Anything you'd like to share? 
It's still muted though. But... Oh, oh no! Well, um, it's a very, very, very um, mm. new um, revelations for me. I mean, I love the way you you kind of relate, you know, um, everything together with, uh, you know, I love the way you um you associated us with, you know, likeness of God Himself, you know. Mm. I'm seeing myself in a new picture, you know, that I can do all things in Christ. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so ma I'm looking forward to, to see, you know, in this journey. I, I, I'm very happy I'm here. I'm looking forward to see the rest that you have for us. I'm happy to hear, I'm happy that you're here too. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, Vida, if you want to just post in the comment section there, how, any feedback from you, um, and also, how does this impact your comprehension of the, as I put it, the panorama of the scriptures and where that puts you now? I'll be welcomed. Holy Sister Odelia, want to say anything at all? I'm trying to open this thing up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty much. Um, clear, you know, I just need to know about that that heart thing. Right. Um, yeah, because that, like, if it don't come from the heart, uh, you know, oh, he waited good for I was talking. Hold on, boy. <laughs> yeah. Here, too. Turn this, turn this for me, too. Oh, here you go. All right, excuse me, y'all. That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, the heart thing, because I know you you can say some things out of your mouth, but it, if it don't come from the heart, yeah, yeah. it's um you know you just being a parrot or something. The, your real your real essence, right? Your real essence, the real essence of who you are and what you are flows from your heart. So if you're not functioning from your heart, you are not releasing your real essence. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to understand it so I can know how to share that with the children when I teach the children right. about the heart because we, when we, as we grow up um, and learning in, in uh, the churches, they say, you know, they teach you, they says, well, where Jesus at? And they say, in your heart, but are we, are we, you know, is it 